What is up my peeps, Joshua Smith here with another GSD interview. Every single week we interview top entrepreneurs and just straight up top badasses that they're dominating their space. These are people that are choosing to not live a life of mediocrity, but instead to go out there and create massive lives for themselves and for their families. So today you guys, we got a very special guest on the show, um, a guy that I've been following for years and years and years. Actually, when I created this podcast, and, and I know you're busy, but I got to go into the story for just a second, Ryan. Um, when I created this podcast, I had to define what success uh, for me with having this show would be. And uh, when I defined that, it was it, it was and it was hard to define, you know, because you're looking at views, you're looking at monetization. Um, but ultimately, I defined that by getting Ryan Blair on the show. So those of you that are watching this, this is a it's like a, an absolute dream come true for me with the show and the podcast, man. So. So um, can't stress enough how, how honored and excited I am to have you on the show, dude. That's awesome, man. Joshua, thank you for the kind words, man. It's awesome to be able to know that I, I contributed to your business, and I'm glad to be on the show with you, man. It's awesome. Yeah, I love it, brother. So I know time's tight, so we'll just jump right in. So yeah. um, you know, first off, Ryan's first book, Nothing to Lose, Everything to Gain. Um, and we're going to do a contest, you guys. A, uh, uh, I went out there and pre-ordered 100 of Ryan's new books. He's got a new book that's being launched here in October. So I pre-ordered 100 of those. We're actually going to have some instructions at the end of the show. So you got to watch the show first. At the end, we we'll a few steps for you to take. Well, we'll actually, I'll personally ship you. Um, we're going to ship out 100 of those plus a free GSD shirt um, covering shipping, all of that. There's no catches for those that you follow the, the instructions that we're going to give. So make sure to stay tuned for those. Um, so I know time's tight, so we don't have time to really get into your full story, dude. Um, you know, but your first book, everybody that's out there, go pick up this book. I personally read it at least half a dozen times. Um, it's, it's an epic book about Ryan's story of, of growing up, coming from the, the first class to, to experiencing poverty, getting into gangs, uh, uh, winding up in jail to turning his life around and becoming a very, very successful entrepreneur. So make sure you check that up. Um, but real quick, man, so you just launched this second book. Dude. What, what inspired you to write uh, your new book? Yeah, so uh, I got a, I got the first copy right here. It's called Rock But I'm the Rockstar, uh, Lessons from the Business School of Hard Knocks. My last book uh, created a lot of value, and, and, uh, you know, and, but during the process of writing my last book, it was really a tribute to my mentor and what I learned about you know, overcoming poverty and, and adversity. This book, after Nothing to Lose, uh, took off in 2010. So did my business. Vaisalis went to do nearly $2 billion in sales. Um, my other investments really took off as well. My book became a number one New York Times bestselling book and international success. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, I learned that my son had autism. Uh, my relationship with his mother fell apart. And uh, uh, so I had to, the challenges of being a new father, uh, a new single father at that with a child with autism and having to figure out how to you know, maintain my business and my entrepreneurial endeavors and, and you know, still maximize my potential for greatness. And, um, and then also my mother fell down a flight of stairs during that period of time and wound up in a coma for two years. And so, you know, I, uh, uh, my, my, uh, you know, I had three uh, ma amazing things happen to me. One, I had this phenomenal wealth creation. And then two, uh, you know, I had to deal with being a father and a single father and a father with a child with autism. And then be a son to my mother who was on her deathbed for two years. And then she woke up miraculously. It's a miracle. At the end of the two-year period, she woke up from her coma. And uh, I got to, you know, really get some perspective on how to manage personal adversity and then still be able to triumph in business at the same time. And so that's what I write about. And I write mostly about the mistakes that I made along the way and the challenges. You know, as you know, if you're reading the last book, you know, I'm one of the few business authors out there that actually tells it like it is. And I'll tell you both sides of the story as best I can. And I'll tell you my internal dialogue going on when I'm doing these deals or, you know, working through these challenges, which I've had many of them. Yeah, and you know, what I loved about your book, man, is, you know, I, I, most of our listeners, I'm a millennial, most of our listeners are, are millennials, and it's tough to relate. You know, you, of course, you got your greats out there, like the Jim Rohns and the Brian Tracys, but, you know, it's very, very tough to relate. And your book was the first book where I was like, dude, I can actually relate with this dude and connect with this guy. And, and yeah, and you get at you totally real in the book, so I love it. Yeah, the, you know, Elite Daily was founded, uh, the Gerard Adams actually founded the company after reading my book, so it's really cool. I, I'm like the big brother to millennials. I'm 39. I think so like 36 is the cutoff. So I, I love that position. Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an honor. Um, you know, uh, I, I just, I, I grew up on, uh, uh, you know, rap and hip hop and NWA. I live in Los Angeles and, you know, you see the home around me. Uh, I, you know, I, I, uh, I, I, my inspirations, although I learned a lot from Jim Rohn and I've learned a lot from Tony Robbins, they just felt too good to be true. You know, I'm like you, I got tattoos all over me. I got, you know, I was in a gang. Uh, my uh, business inspiration came from guys like Jay-Z and those types of folks, right? Because that's, that's what they rap about is, you know, coming up. 
So that's, you know, that's what I talk about in my book. So I think that, you know, my writing is, is a little different than other business books out there. I'm not like, uh, you know, just have a positive attitude all the time. Although I try to do that, uh, you know, I don't always live to that standard and I'm willing to admit it. Yeah, I love it, man. So recently you started writing for LinkedIn, you know, which is cool. I, I kind of I kind of lost interest in LinkedIn about two years ago and I saw you started writing for them and I, I had yeah. to re-go out there and figure out what my password was and re-engage, yeah, uh, dude. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I use LinkedIn as a platform to talk about business. Um, you know, I've, I've done a lot of big transactions and I started a venture fund called Hashtag One and we've invested in a lot of cool companies. Uh, and as a result of that, you know, I, I got to have my name out there in the business world to drive deal flow uh, and that type of stuff. But, you know, I also, um, uh, you know, I, I love documentary film as a genre. I love anything where I get to teach. Uh, you know, I, I give speeches. I, you know, I, I write books. I, I write articles. Um, you know, I, I do documentaries. In essence, I'm just a teacher. And I just teach what I've learned and in, in, in my perspective as a result of my unique uh, set of environmental conditions that have occurred that, you know, other people perhaps haven't seen or experienced the same way. Yeah, I love it, man. So, um, all right, dude. So, you know, my first question for you is, you know, I know business and life can be very difficult. You know, people see what you have today with the cars and the house and, you know, they don't really realize, you know, all, all those difficult uh, journeys you've had to come over. Um, and from studying you you in depth, dude, it just seems like yourself, along with a lot of these other uber successful entrepreneurs, um, have like this innate, like this almost superhuman power, dude, to just... Uh, uh, to absorb more pain, to not allow the, the universe, the world to break them. It's like you get tested in a way and not allow yourself to get, get broken. And you're a dude that's been tested business-wise, family-wise, you know, to, to, to a level that 99.9% that of people would break. H how do you not break? What keeps you driving? How do you get through those low moments? Yeah, great, great question. So my, you know, one, I have a belief system that all this shit is happening for a reason. And, and like I'm supposed to, and a lot of times it's my own fault, my own responsibility. So one is belief that it's happening for a reason that, you know, I'm supposed to be battle tested. And, you know, one of my philosophies is what weakens you, strengthens you, you know, in order to build up a muscle, you got to tear it apart. Um, if you tear it apart correctly, uh, you know, you'll build it back up stronger. If you break a bone and it heals correctly, it'll be stronger in the place where it broke. And so that's the way the human body is made. And uh, I believe that you have to be tested and you have to be challenged. And, uh, and you know, it's happening for a reason and it's to grow you. And it's, you know, in, in my case, the reason why I shared my story, my son's autism or my mother's coma, because I knew that maybe if I did, I'd be able to help someone out there going through a similar challenge. And, the, you know, as a result, I've helped a lot of people. So it's a bit of a combination between a spiritual thing and a healing thing in terms of, you know, me wanting to, you know, fix these problems that, that have, you know, that have, that have uh, appeared in my life, whether they be my own fault or, you know, the fault of, of um, you know, the economy or this side or the other. So, you know, Joshua, it's the same stuff, though. We don't have a superpower. Uh, you know, I, I, I think every one of us has a unique strength, and you just got to play to those strengths. And obviously, you got a strength. A lot of your audience does. You just got to learn your strengths and play to them and get people around you to help you play to them as well. And that's, that's a, that, my success is more to do with other people than it is to do with me. Yeah, love it, man. So, um, you know, when you started off, when, when you went off on your own, when you were, uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the computer company, but when, when you kind of first ventured off from your stepfather, you know, you're making 100 grand a year, you break off and, and uh, was it 24 7 tech and, and you know, ma making, uh, you know, a million dollar business. Now you're running billion dollar companies, dude. What, what were some of the, you know, and I know it's tough to narrow them all down, but some of the, like the top two, three, three things that you've learned to become, uh, whether it's a discipline, habit, focus that have taken you from million dollar companies to now billion dollar companies? Yeah, well, yeah, I guess number one thing is it's about the team. Uh, you gotta put the team first uh, and you gotta put the company first in that. So I, I didn't know that, I learned that, you know, um, along the way because it's real easy when you're a soloist like I was and an entrepreneur and, you know, and uh, it's real easy to think that it's all about you. So that would be number one um, uh, thing that I learned. Number two is, you, you know, and I, I say, I, I went from having a nothing to lose mindset, which meant like I didn't give a shit. I was going to win no matter what. I had nothing to lose. I wasn't going to go back to a one bedroom shack. Um, now, you know, when all of a sudden you have a child and you got, you know, houses and all that stuff, uh, then you have a lot to lose. And, and, and in fact, I was going to name my next book everything to lose because my first one was nothing to lose. Uh, but not a lot of people are going to relate to that because more people have nothing to lose than everything. But I guess what I've learned along the way to answer your question specifically for the third point is that you got to protect your assets and you got to make sure that you, you know, you plan for a rainy day, so to speak. So you have to have a good strategy that makes sure that you're still in the game for the long term. Um, and then the last thing I'll tell you, I mean, I'm, I'm about to celebrate my 20th year anniversary 
Uh, I started as a, a software engineer working for a software company in 1996. And that was when I made the decision I was going to reinvent myself from gang member to, you know, to technologist. And then I reinvented myself from technologist to entrepreneur, uh, from entrepreneur to author, uh, from author to public company, you know, uh, uh, pre vice president, uh, you know, and, and so in essence, life is about reinvention. And, uh, and so a lot of times people have this identity and they just need to go on a path to reinvent it along the way and they forget to do that. So I've learned a lot about reinvention as well. Yeah, love it, man. So when you were when you were first starting with your path here, you know, I know that you learned so much in the gangs, and, and you talk about hey, your your top gang leaders could be top CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. Did you did were you correlating the two at the time? Like here here's what worked well when I was running the gang, or is it stuff that you reflected on later? Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the things that and I I, I wrote about it's going to come up in a future article is called uh, finding an analogy. So in business, so like for example, I don't know. I'm gonna. I don't know if this is gonna mess it up, but we'll see. I don't know if you can see, uh, but outside my window right there, that's my view of Hollywood. Uh, there's a there's an antenna tower that you might have just saw when I when I turned it toward you. That antenna tower is a, co a company called Sky Pipeline that I used to own. Now Sky Pipeline's in the wireless broadband business. When Visalis came to me, uh, you know they would send uh, uh, nutrients into the cell, and Sky Pipeline would send zeros and ones into the air. I saw them as one and the same. So uh, that's the analogy concept. So like, for example, in, in a gang, I was running an illegal enterprise, uh, you know, but it's an economic system. It's a volunteer army. You're, you tend to buy products uh, low and sell them high. Uh, you know, it's, there's a lot of same components in terms of, you know, um, uh, you know running a, a business. And so I just saw analogies and I've used that same concept to pivot into other businesses or build, you know, I've started companies that, that resulted in, you know, having to change dramatically from their original plan. And it's just because I'm sitting there always looking for what's the analogy, what's the analogy, you know, what's, what's, what's the pivot. And I've had a few pivots in my life that have worked out. Yeah, love it, man. So, dude, with everything that you got going on today, I mean, you're, you're writing books, you're obviously writing for a lot of publications, Vicealis, so multiple, I mean, $2 billion a year in sales now, which is just insane. Um, but also, you know, your father, you take care of your health, angel investor. So you got to be really brilliant at what to say no to and what to say yes yeah. to. Because I know you're pitched constantly with yeah. things. Do you have like an internal strategy that you follow so you know what to say yes and what to say no to and, and that you abide by? Yeah, well, you know, uh, so for one, we when we sold Vicealis, we sold it for uh, a $792 million deal. And then we recently bought it back. And so we're turning that company around. Uh, my strategy is to get the right people to work, you know, in the right um, seats on the bus. And it might look like I'm involved in 10 different things, and I'm really not. I, I don't like it. One of the things that's a pet peeve of mine is when an entrepreneur brags about how many businesses they're involved in. It's like that's, that, there's no love in that, right? Um, uh, focus is saying no. Uh, now, my strategy, and that's, that's a philosophy. So I always say to myself, to be truly focused, you have to say no. Um, and the way I say no to things is I have a team around me that properly looks at every transaction. We look for ROI in terms of our, you know, we're looking for a return on our investment. So we're not doing this for charity. Um, and I try to get uh, team members around me that are willing to work 100 hours a week. Um, now, and I, I, I got to tell you, a lot of people are saying, well, I have money, so that's easy to do. I've been doing that since before I had money. And the way that I got people that were highly talented, like yourself, Joshua, and some of the other people I've had the privilege of working with uh, is I basically given them a piece of the opportunity uh, and, you know, a piece of ownership in the company. And I've made, I don't know, maybe uh, at least 50 to 100 people, several million dollars as a result of them taking a risk on me. One guy, he just had his birthday. His name's John Lon. He, he uh, his market rate salary wise would have been, let's say, 100 grand. And he gave me 37,000 of it back in, in terms of uh, he didn't take the full market rate. And so. I gave him stock for that 37,000 and he made something like four or five million bucks from it. So, you know, I've always tried to carve people in and get people to work very, very hard uh, with a lot of passion, a lot of ambition. And, uh, and you know, and, and if I can find people like that that have good business ideas like Gerard Adams at Elite Daily or some of the other people, Lewis Howes and some of the other people that I've had the pleasure of working with, well, you know, then, I, then it's natural for me to work with them because, you know, it, I, there's a stylistic match and there's a huge opportunity we can both, you know, take, take advantage of. Yeah, and, and I think, though, I mean, if those read your first book or listeners that have read your first book would understand, but when he sold Vaisalis, you know, it sounds good, but then it, it went south, man, and you had, to, you had to give back every, I mean, essentially every single penny and work for free and, and rebuild it, right? Yeah, so yeah, it, sometimes you got to go all in, man. Uh, 
And, and that's what people don't understand. understand. Like, um, I, I guess because I have a nothing to lose mentality, that's innate. Now, you know, as I've, as I've you know, bought some insurance, so to speak, you know, I've, I've, uh, I've tried to create situations where I'm, I'm, you know, I'm more secure than I was before. And, and I know that my son's going to be taken care of in the long term. Uh, you know, because he has special needs, I got to make sure that that happens. That's first and foremost. But I don't need all this shit. Uh, you know, I, I don't need Ferraris and all that stuff. You know, I really don't. Uh, what drives me and fulfills me is seeing something I build uh, create a legacy and a life of its own, knowing that, you know, some of your audience is going to get some inspiration and maybe start a company, knowing that you, when you defined your podcast and said, you know, you had, I somehow got into your head about me being a part of your success in your podcast. And today that, that, that day has come. So to me, that's, that's the currency I trade on. And it's a real simple philosophy. It's called the law of reciprocation. The more that you give, the more that you receive. And so I try to just give first and I give so much of myself and then eventually it comes back to you. And, and sometimes like just the other day, um, you know, I, I learned that I, I donated to a charity and that charity used my money a hundred percent of it and they saved actual lives. Like I got letters of human beings that were alive because this charities work and they would have died otherwise. And I get, I just, it, I got, I got the chills from it. So to me, like those are the moments that, that matter the most and all these businesses and everything that I'm doing are to help do more of that and to fix, you know, some of the big problems going on in our society. Right. Yeah, love it, man. So I, I heard you on Lewis Howe's podcast, and uh, awesome, awesome interview. Um, and on there, you, you you know, he asked a question about your father, and your father kind of resurfacing back in your life, and you made a comment of, "Hey, I, I I don't spend time with him or hang out with him because I don't I don't surround myself with those that I deem to be unintelligent." You know, and and, and, and I love the I love the I know I, I mean I love the quote, man, and, and 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 you know I can get that with maybe your father because he made some unintelligent choices early on in life. But as far as you know, there's sayings out there that you're a result of five people that you spend the most time with and it becomes very difficult i mean how do you how do you know in your inner circles whether you deem them to be somebody that that's should be in your life or like you've outgrown them and need to move on yeah well you know and i, I guess i gotta say I, I did do an update on uh with lewis recently that podcast hasn't uh aired you know i i do plan to, to to meet my dad i haven't seen him since i was 13 he hasn't met his son yet i'm doing that uh uh, purely out of forgiveness and, and out of love. And I want my uh, dad to, you know, one day when he passes away to rest in peace, knowing that, you know, that we're square. Uh, I wouldn't be the man that I am if it weren't for uh, the, the, the conditions that I was put in. Now, that doesn't give him, you know, he, he, his first letter that he wrote to me, he said, like, I knew you could do it. And almost like he, almost like he uh, did it on purpose because he knew I was going to be so great that all he had to do was throw me out to the wilderness and I'd come back a grown man. That, that, that's not, no way to be a father, but, you know, my dad and I have since, uh, you know, at least had a little friendship. We talk on Facebook every once in a while. Um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, so I want to make sure that you understood that. But on, on the other side of it, back to your circle of influence, um, I, when I was first coming up, I had no time for anyone that wasn't on the same uh, path as I was. I mean, I would break up with relationships because they weren't growing at the same speed that I was. You know, people will hold you back or they'll grow with you and they'll, you know, they'll catapult you. Um, and so you got to be very careful who you surround yourself with. Now, I'll tell you, after I became, you know, successful, I got this entourage. And next thing you know, this entourage, great people, they're all around me. Uh, but, you know, like I'm not growing anymore. And so I made a decision that I was going to have to be very tactical. And I was going to have to surround myself with different people intentionally. And that was, uh, you know, uh, maybe three, four years ago. when I said, you know, it's really easy for me to roll out, go to the nightclub, spend 50000 on bottle service. Everybody has fun. I don't have to work. You know, I've made enough money to retire, but that's no way to live. And so now that I'm 39, heading to 40, I've kind of grown up a bit, and I've made sure that people I surround myself with and the things that I'm doing, you know, they're, they're going to have a long-term impact, not just a short-term gratification. Yeah, love it, man. So you talk about the importance of mentorship in, in your life, you know, or all of our lives, right? So when you're searching for a mentor, you know, because dudes like you are extremely busy. You know, somebody can't just call you up and be like, hey, man, you got time for coffee? Can I pick your brain? Yeah, you know, what, I, get, how, I get the email all the time. Yeah. yeah. So, so how, how do people reach up? If they're like, hey, man, I know that this is where I want to go. How do I go up and reach up? Because you've had some amazing mentors, you know, Coach John yeah. Wooden and some I mean, how do you reach up for those successfully? Yeah, well, I, you know, for one, I try to, um, uh, one, I'm a student. When I'm in front of that mentor, I'm a student. Even today, uh, you know, I had the privilege of spending some time with um, uh, Dan Gilbert, the founder of Quicken Loans and the owner of the Cavaliers. And I'm sitting in his office and on his whiteboard, there's a uh, uh, prep for Ryan Blair meeting. And there's like 10 things on his whiteboard in his office. And I got to spend about an hour and a half with him. 
And I thought to myself, this guy's prepping for me, multi-billionaire owner of the Cavaliers. Like a lot of times people don't prep, uh, you know, and so when they do get in front of their mentor, you know, they just, they don't add any value. They don't have any specific questions. And so there's no way I can actually, you know, uh, you know, exchange value. Secondly is a lot of times people just ask, uh, uh, you know, for free stuff. Like I want your time. My time's not free. Every, every minute I spend with someone, I'm not spending with my son. Or I'm not spending with the families that I support through my businesses or I'm not spending, you know, fulfilling myself personally. So you got to somehow show me how you're going to uh, 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 give me value for my time. Now, and, and, and when I say value, I'm not talking about cash because I'm not a consultant. Uh, I would charge too much money for an hourly rate. Nobody could afford it. And very few that could, they, they might not get the value out of it. And I, you know, uh, for a while there, I was making like $36,000 an hour or something like that, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So, you know, why would I spend an hour, you know, talking about how someone stubbed their toe today, which is what most mentor requests look like. But I do have a formula. People want to work with me or other mentors. They don't have money. Uh, let's do a time trade. So if you gave like, say, 100 hours to my charity or gave 100 hours to a charity that I liked and you wanted one hour of my time, I'd do that deal. Right. A lot of times people just don't get creative and try to find a way to add a level of value. It's a mutual exchange of time and value. Uh, and there's ways to do it. Um, it might be that, you know, you learn what I like. You know, it always um, dumbfounds me when people seek a mentorship request from me and they write me this thing and they haven't even read my book or they haven't done their homework. Right. Like, you know, you know, I have a book out there and you're just going to bypass that and try to go straight straight to me for help when I've given you the exact instructions of how to receive my help in my book. Right. So, you know, I'm not I'm not trying to be an ass here. I, my time is valuable. I got a son with autism, uh, you know, and I got to spend as much time as I can with him. And, um, and, you know, and so one, be coachable, uh, two, be a student, three, uh, uh, you know, talk about a trade, um, uh, try to add value, uh, four, be persistent. Uh, one guy drove 20 hours, uh, from Portland to take a 15 minute meeting with me. And I was like, I was like, you drove 20 hours for 15 minutes. And he goes, yep. And I was like, all right, that's persistence. That's, that's something special. I'll give you more than 20 minutes. I've since uh, given him some money to manage and, you know, and, and he's doing well now. So, you know, you got to You got to just show up and you got to go the extra mile. I've had I've had a lot of great entrepreneurs find a way. And if you you know now I'm not the right mentor for everyone. You got to target multiple mentors. Um, your mentors will constantly change in your life as they do with mine. And you got to constantly try to find ways to add value to your mentors. So um, uh, in, in order to keep them within, you know, your your reach. Um, and I always am looking at ways to do that. So like. You know, even like, for example, I invested in a big deal a company called Heal. Press release goes out uh, next week. Uh, Larry Ellison, Thomas Toll and some big hitters are all involved in this, this company. I, I was a seed investor, early investor in um, pre-Series A, for those of you familiar with it. And that said, you know, the moment I made that investment, I reached out to some of my mentors and said, hey, if you want a piece of it, I'm happy to carve you in to add value, to constantly show them that I'm, I'm playing for a value exchange. And a lot of people just don't do that. I do it every day. That's the formula, the secret to my success has been finding when I bump into a person that I can receive value from, I immediately go out of my way to add value to them. So that way, I, if in the event they want to play, you know, value exchange, uh, I might one day receive value back. Now, when you're looking to seek a mentor, though, I mean, how, how do you identify what the right mentor would be for you? I mean, do you, are you identifying certain holes that you might have in your business or your life that they've been successful at? Or how do, how do you know if they're the right mentor, you know, to go after uh, in the first place? Well, there's, a, there's so one, you got to just say you're a student, right? Like declare yourself right now. I'm a student. I don't know it all. Uh, in fact, I don't know shit in many cases. I don't even know what I don't know. And so declare yourself a student. Um, and, 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 you know, and I, I've, I've got some experience of 20 years at this now, but, you know, I'm still got to be a student. So a lot of times, you know, you, when you think you know it all, you're not open to receive. And there's no proverb when the, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. All right. And so I, I really believe that. I look for, um, I, when I walk to the airports, I look at books, I'll grab a book and, you know, and if I resonate with the book, I'll buy that book because I know I'm contributing to that author. I'll go on to YouTube. I'll watch, like, for example, I bought Howard Schultz's, uh, onward and it's about how he, uh, turned Starbucks around. And it just so happened that I needed to learn about that because I was in the middle of a turnaround at Vice House. I, you know, I got on his YouTube, watched his uh, videos on the subject, read his book, shared the book with friends and family. Uh, and then, you know, use some of that. Now, I've never met Howard. I hope to one day meet him, but he was a mentor to me in the turnaround and still is. So it's not all about the one-on-one -on -one and, and, and calling these guys friends. It's about seeing yourself as a student from these individuals, guys and girls for that matter, and trying to learn from everyone at all times and then applying what you learn 
And then eventually, when those teachers out there, like Howard, hear about your application, or like you, Joshua, I just heard about the application of some of my teaching that you've done, then, you know, we're, we're, we're bonded for life, right? I mean, you know, the biggest gift you could give to a teacher is showing the actions that you've taken uh, based on what you've learned. And as a teacher, once you teach somebody something, you have a student for life, right? So, you know, uh, that's all I see myself as, as a teacher and a student. Yeah, I love it. And the amazing thing about the world that we live in today is, uh, you know, this is the first time I've ever talked to you, but I've looked at you as a mentor for years and years, dude, right? So it's like, any answer that I've had, where it's like, okay, what would Ryan do in this situation with YouTube and books? I mean, it's pretty much out there. You've written about yeah. it. Yeah, this generation, I got to tell you, uh, you guys have it easier than ever. And I do too. Um, you know, when I first started my career, you wrote letters to people. Email, 1996, email, like most, most of the older folks out there that I needed mentorship from had yet to adopt the email. Now, I, I know that's, that's aging me, but, you know, we didn't have um, YouTube. We didn't have Facebook, we didn't have Instagram, we didn't have blogs, we didn't have any of that stuff. We had to like get in front of people. Nowadays, you can do your research, do your homework, target your mentors, communicate with them directly in many cases. Because um, human beings have an innate value to teach and to leave a legacy. It is, it is in our DNA, whether you're spiritual or not, that's how we're wired, whether you, you believe in evolution or you believe in spirituality. We are wired to teach and leave uh, you know, our, what we've learned uh, and the knowledge that we've obtained and the secrets and the tradecraft to the next generation. That's how we're wired. And so knowing that, you know, just reach out there to everybody and try to touch their teacher button and, you know, and make sure that you do so by saying, I'm a big student of yours and, and you know, and or fan or whatever the case is. And I need to learn from you this, this, that and the other. And, um, and I'm willing to, for example, and I'm giving you the format that I would reach out to these people. I'm willing to give you, a, I don't have money. Uh, I don't even have a company in some cases. Uh, but I'll, I'll give you time to the charity of your choice. If you give me an hour of your time, I'll give you 10 of mine to the charity of your choice. There's not a lot of people that won't take you up on that because, you know, you know you've, you've just basically uh, shown that you're willing to show up. And you're willing to do some hard work uh, in exchange for some valuable time. Yeah, love it, man. Powerful stuff. So in, in your first book, you talk about uh, – not letting anybody steal your milk, your milk, right? That, that you learned in juvie, dude. Um, I can't imagine anybody trying to, to mess with your milk nowadays, you know. But I'm sure it happens all the time. Oh, what, do, man. What, what's, what's, what's like a recent uh, recent story where, where somebody tried to steal your milk and you had to shut them down? Uh, you know, there's uh, there there's some. The recent ones are, you know, I invest in businesses and and when they misappropriate my money, I take it very seriously. Um, because once again, my money can be used to save lives and it's not to be used for your lifestyle. And this is what I've told some of these entrepreneurs. Um, there's a big chance that, that you'll be reading about uh, some of this in future articles and other press stuff. Um, you know, when I was taking, selling Vaisalis and the investment bankers wanted me to go public, you know, there was an element of them trying to get me to compromise, to take my wealth away when I had a, you know, I had a guaranteed buyout. So every day there's somebody out there trying to steal your milk. I wrote an article on LinkedIn the other day about the three classes, about how the wealthy class is trying to basically extract uh, the equity and uh, the value out of the middle class and shift it upward, so to speak. And so, you know, that's, that's, that's part of life right now. People are out there and there's a lot of smart people targeting you, targeting your customers, targeting your businesses. Uh, and those smart people are working at Google. They're working at Facebook. Uh, they're, they're trying to steal my milk right now. Like Amazon is trying to figure out how to basically ship my products faster than I can so they can make more money on my own products uh, than I am in some cases. So, you know, a lot of smart people out there, they're, they're uh, forcing uh, innovation and revolutionizing and changing industries as we know it. So you got to get in the race. Otherwise, you're going to lose, uh, you know, you're either going to lose or you're not going to maximize your potential. Yep, love it, man. And, and one thing that, you know, I've noticed with you is, is you know, okay, you've got Vaisalis, this massive company, but you've also – been very intentional about creating your own personal Ryan Blair brand, almost separate of that. Is that something that you would recommend entrepreneurs today is create their own personal brand in addition to the company brand? Yeah, well, you know, Jay-Z said, I'm not a businessman, I'm a business man, right? So, uh, you know, I, I, um, I decided that I was going to create my own personal brand because I have my own style, I have my own story, and I want to tell it to help people. Um, and, you know, and, I, and it gives me some sort of uh, – uh, you know, just clarity and process of, of who I am and what I'm all about. Um, all a company is is a bunch of people. You know, Apple was Steve Jobs, and it still is largely. Now, it's, it's, it's certainly shifted, but I know, I th when I think of Apple, I think of Steve Jobs to this day. Uh, you know, when you think of Ford, you think of Henry Ford. When you think of Quicken Loans, you think of Dan Gilbert. When you think of uh, Oracle, you think of Larry Ellison, uh, Microsoft, Bill Gates. You know, these are the individuals uh, and the brands of these individuals are very important to the growth and success of the company. 
Now, eventually, your, pri your personal brand uh, is not as important as the brand of the team and the brand of the company. Uh, but to get started, people buy from other people. They don't buy from companies. So you having a brand, you having an expert uh, voice. And one of the things that I learned early on is, you know, I, before I walk into a room, I want to influence the people so I don't have to spend all this time talking about myself. So like, you know, like you said earlier, like you don't need to hear my whole story because you've already heard that, right? So you and I can immediately get to business and have a connection because I did create a personal brand. I did get my story out there. And as a result, we could do business much easier than we would if we had to start from the, from the beginning of both of our life stories to somehow find mutual ground and do business. Um, and so a personal brand is a big element to do that. It's also a way that you can have security. Uh, but on the inverse side, you know, uh, you know, uh, you're going to get targeted. You're going to get a lot of people that go after you because you've taken the you've taken the uh, the risk and the leap, and you said, you know what, I'm different, and I'm going to make my mark. And and a lot of people don't like that. They want to tear you down. Uh, they want to criticize you because they perhaps don't have the same belief system or value system, or they don't believe you. I mean, I've got more criticism, uh, uh, you know, and and I learned to deal with it. I've got thick skin now. But when I first put my book out there, it was a bit scary, you know, like nothing to lose. How I went from gang member, I. I, I covered up all my tats and, and, and reinvented myself as a tech entrepreneur. No one, no one knew of that past, but I told the story because I wanted to help others through their past as well. And, and uh, that's why I tell the story of Rock Bottom to Rockstar and why I'm so focused on that. So my brand is connected to my purpose and not just to making money. And my purpose is you know, to impact you know, millions and now billions of people uh, to help them through the same adversities that I've experienced. Yeah, I love it, man. How, how are we doing on time? I know they told me I got like, okay, good. Got, I got a few questions left for you here. I know they told me I had 20 minutes, so I wanted to respect that. Yeah, hey, well, I mean, I'm not rushing out. The, the other people can wait, but I got, I'm like Discovery Channel. I'm all over the place right now with this book launch. So, you know, I, I appreciate you having me on, man. It's really important to me to get this book out there and know that I, I did my best to see what I could do and push it as far as I could. So your help is very important. Yeah, I love it, man. Like I said, it's an honor. So so we find in life that good very easily becomes the worst enemy to greatness, right? You see a lot of legends fall because um, yeah. they get comfortable. And you're a guy right now that, that could very easily get comfortable. You have enough money. You could just coast for the rest of your life. What keeps you never settling for good enough, always going for greatness and, and always leveling up in life? Yeah, you know, I, I got to say, I have been, I have uh, suffered from being comfortable. Um, after I sold uh, Vaisalis, I, you know, I, I made a lot of money. I had a guaranteed deal, golden parachutes, you know, won the Urson Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award, consumer products, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and, you know, I started to feel myself slip away from my strengths. And uh, I, I, when I used to play baseball as a kid, uh, I could never hit a slow, uh, a slow pitch. Like, I never had any game in the slow pitch. And the coaches would always get frustrated because, like, I was the sloppiest hitter when it came to slow pitches. But on fastballs, man, I could knock them out of the park. So for me, my speed and my cadence is very important to my success. And when I'm doing less, I get more comfortable. And when I get more comfortable, I perhaps, you know, I don't optimize. So everybody's got to find their own tempo. Uh, my tempo is the fast pitch. And, you know, uh, I'm, I'm at my best when I, uh, you know, I, I probably get 1,000 bats, 1,000 at-bats a year, so to speak. Uh, versus taking, you know, one or two a year or three or four a year. So um, I got to get there and I got to constantly practice. I got to constantly work on my trade uh, in order for me to be at my optimal level. And then that fulfills me when I feel like I've done something or I've, I've hit a new new level. And I'll, I'll give you a, a simple example. You know, I'm giving a speech to the National Autism Association in New Orleans and I'm talking with single mothers and, uh, and uh, mothers with kids with autism. And, you know, I just said, hey, when you, when you walk into your, your child's school, you're the CEO. And like all of a sudden these women felt empowered and light, like the lights went up and, you know, and all, all these women were like, okay, I guess I am the CEO of my child's education because I pay taxes and these people work for me. And like, and, and, you know, and I just saw that, wow, I hit a new level where I could relate being a CEO to a mother who had never thought of herself that way, give her some practical tips, empower her and see her take action now on behalf of her, her children. And that just came like last week. So, you know, so when I'm growing, I'm, 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 you know, I guess they say like uh, human beings are like trees. If you're not growing, you're dying. When I'm growing, you know, I'm, I'm living. And when I'm not growing and being comfortable means you're not growing, you know, you're, you're, you're going backward. And, and that's a scary thing. So I haven't been perfect all the time. I do have a, a system uh, where, you know, I, I, I check on myself every six months and I ask myself if I obtained what I want to do. Am I happy with who am I being? And, you know, and there's a lot of things I'm not happy about that I got to fix. And I got to work on. And it's a constant 
you know, it's a constant uh, uh, growth. And growth is painful. It's never easy. So right now I'm growing as an individual, as I think your audience is and we all are, because we have no choice. The world is changing. If you don't grow, it's going to change right out from underneath you. And, and you're going to be left behind. You're not going to have jobs. You're not going to have fulfillment. You know, I mean, there's a lot of people out there that are targeting, you know, you, your job and, and you know, your path uh, and their profit motives might get in the way of it. And, and if that, that happens, happens, man, you got to be prepared. prepared. Yeah, love it. And I want to give Vice Alice a quick plug here. Um, what, what's really cool about this show and our audience is they're all, you know, we're, we're really twofold. We're, we're, we're entrepreneurship and then health and fitness. So we have a lot of, you know, Olympic athletes and a lot of uh, health and fitness professionals. And Vice Alice is a, is a health and fitness product, is, essentially, right? Um, um, and uh, my, my aunt broke her, her leg recently and she gained like 60 pounds. She's like, Josh, what do I do? And I put her on uh, V shape and she lost literally like 30 pounds in the first 45 wow. days. So it's amazing, amazing product. It absolutely yeah. works. Um, so you guys have to go by the way on product development, product design. Like I, I taste every one of our products. Like I, I just bought this company called neon. Uh, this is a little bit of a plug. Uh, every one of our products I take, I taste test every single one of them. I'm a fanatic on them because I would only put in my body what I believe is the best. Um, and, and, you know, I'm a mass marketing company, so, you know, I have millions of people that have tried my product and utilized my product, tens of millions, if not more. And so, you know, I really try to focus on creating the greatest results for people like your aunt that you just described. Um, and, you know, and it's awesome when I hear, you know, kind of, uh, you know, that, you know, those stories come back to me where, you know, I know that I've helped a family that perhaps I had no direct connection to. So that's awesome to hear. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this stuff works. It tastes good. The V crunch cereals out of this world, dude. Yeah, out of control, yeah. Our new vegan shake is pretty good too. I'm not a vegan. But I know a lot of people prefer vegan products, uh, and so you know, I uh, we invented one that's just—it's. I think it's probably the best tasting, uh, best vegan shake product out there at the price. So we're we're really proud of it. So with that company there, man, because I mean the, the supplement world, there's so many different supplements yeah. that exist out there. But you guys have really honed in on being brilliant at, at the few, right? How do you again? I mean, with that, I mean, how do you decide what products we're going to launch, what we're going to do, what focus we we are going to go? Um. So I, I look at. Uh, uh, I, I first look at my customers as I would look at myself. Like, what's my life like? Um, uh, how hard is it for me to get the right foods in my body? How hard is it for me to eat the right nutrients? You know, a lot of times, for those of us that are really health and fitness oriented, and I, I had a knee injury, I ruptured my patella tendon. So now I'm back in the game working out every day. Like, uh, that's a six month plus, you know, off your, off your leg injury. And I'm finally able to get moving again. But, you know, I'll go through the process and the discipline of, food preparation and all that stuff and making sure that I have. But a lot of people don't uh, have the discipline or the money or the time or the knowledge or the desire to do all the stuff that we do to try to optimize our health. So I have like a few life hacks that I, that I help people through like, you know, uh, uh, you know, and, and basically supplementation is a life hack because you can get most of the nutrients you need if you know exactly where to find them. You spend the time procuring them and you source, you know, the right ingredients and the right foods and so forth. But most people don't have the time, the know-how, the knowledge, or the environment. You know, like I live in California, which has got a lot of uh, Southern California specifically, which has got a lot of health and wellness elitists. But my customers are, you know, in, in Oklahoma, in Alabama, in, uh, in Atlanta. They don't have Whole Foods on every corner. They don't have, you know, uh, all natural, non-GMO, non-gluten, no soy, uh, you know, uh, blah blah blah, free products. Like these people are eating Twinkies and donuts. And so I try to. You know, I try to market to people that, that really need the solution the most, which is, you know, most of the people in, on the planet right now, because, or not most, but 1.8 billion people are overweight, 500 million of which are obese, and that number is growing rapidly right now. So, you know, I'm trying to change that, that trend. trend. Yeah, I love it, man. I love it. So, you know, you're a guy that, um, you know, obviously take great care of your health, energy, massive businesses, but you're there for your son. Um, you know, we see a lot of entrepreneurs that live in these extremes. They're very yeah. successful financially, but they don't know their kids. They're, they're morbidly obese. Their health's gone. Um, you know, how, how do you, I hate the word balance, but how do you balance yeah. it out to make sure you're not yeah. in those extremes? Uh, you know, it's, it, I'm never in balance. I, I just, every day I wake up and I try to figure out what I didn't, you know, the other day, for example, uh, my son uh, didn't like that I was working so much uh, from the house when we were here. And, you know, I jump in the pool with him. Uh, go, I, I drop and do 22 pushups cause I'm doing that veterans challenge right now. And, uh, and then I'd be like talking to, you know, one of the staff members about the book launch or whatever the case is. And, you know, when he said, you know, at the end of the night in his cute little, uh, you know, his, his language is a bit, uh, deficient. He goes to me, he says, uh, yeah, can I tell you something? You know, uh, I didn't like that you work so much today. And I go, all right, I, here's why I'm doing it. You know, I'm doing this for us. It's not just for me. 
And then I said, all right, we'll do some, you know, we'll make some quality time. And, and I really try to make the, the game time adjustment. I guess that's the best analogy I could tell you. And I got it from John Maxwell and also a mentor of mine. He said, you know, the best, um, uh, the best teams are the ones that make a, a, a halftime adjustment. And so, you know, if I'm sitting in my day and I don't like the way it's going, I make a game time, halftime adjustment. And I try to play the rest of the game, you know, uh, having thought through what I did perhaps not do correctly in the first half. You know, I, I use the same pad, uh, approach for a week. I use the same approach for a month where I'm constantly trying to make real time. You know, I'm calling audibles based on what I'm seeing and how I'm feeling uh, and how I'm making other people's feel around me. Because as a CEO of a big company, you know, I walk in the office pissed off, man. And, and like people think, you know, people get scared. And that's not the intention that I have. So I got to make sure that, you know, that, that you know, that, that I uh, understand that more people are watching me as a leader then I realize it. And so I got to, you know, rise to the occasion. I got to step up. Um, Tony Robbins taught me how to put myself in a peak state, which is a, a very cool thing, you know, where, uh, and, and I, I'm a big, uh, I, I got to spend some time with him recently and I'm a friend of his or, or a colleague, I should say. And, uh, and, you know, and, and he has this technique where, you know, he can shift, he helps you learn how to shift your state. And that really helped a lot because a lot of times, you know, I, I can get pissed off. I can, I can have a bad day. I, I have a temper like hell. Uh, you know, uh, I lose my patience and, you know, sometimes I got to, you know, reset. And so that's part of the way that I, I manage the process, particularly in that, you know, you have a lot of stress. And the last thing I'll tell you is you got to work out. You got to try to get yourself in the best health you possibly can because your health is tied to your energy and your energy is tied to your income. And so if you have low energy or bad health, you know, you got to fix it if you want to, you know, have, uh, you know, a rock star business. Yeah, love it. So two quick last questions, and then those of you watching and listening, then we'll uh, walk through the steps to uh, win Ryan's free book. So, um, you know, there, there's 2.4 billion millennials that exist, but there's not 2.4 billion jobs. You know, yeah. you and I both, I've got three young kids. We, we, you know, a lot of those that are listening have young kids. Uh, middle class is getting wiped out, you know, right, before our eyes. Um, how, how, how would you recommend that people prepare their kids? I mean, what do we need to prepare for as, this, as we enter this new economy that's to come? Well, yeah, I wrote an article on LinkedIn about this very subject because, you know, um, jobs are changing and shifting. Like, for example, the company that Larry Ellison, Thomas Toll, and a few others and I just invested in, Heal, we're revolutionizing the way the med medical business works, or particularly um, uh, private practice uh, doctor offices as of now, where we're bringing doctors into the home as opposed to you having to go get the doctor and we're covered by insurance. And as a result, I pay 10 bucks to have a doctor come to my home and give my kid a physical or, you know, look at, you know, um, uh, a sinus infection that he's having or whatever the case is. And I don't have to wait in line and I don't have to go to a private practice. And so there's all these companies out there that are shifting jobs all around. You got to find the ones that are shifting jobs that you're passionate about uh, and, 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 you know, and they're entrepreneurial and the jobs that they're shifting uh, you know, you don't want to be part of, right? So like, I would not be going to medical school to become a doctor to one day have a private practice based on what I know about how the insurance industry is working and the medicine industry is working. But I would, however, go to medical school to become a doctor to perhaps work for a company like Heal, where I could, you know, provide, you know, better quality care and have better fulfillment in, in my job and purpose and so forth. So you got to try to plan ahead and look to what industries are going to be knocked out in the next five to 10 years and try to pick a horse uh, that's going to, you know, do that and, you know, get yourself one of those jobs that we all dream of, like being a founder of Uber, or, you know, founder of Airbnb or whatever the case is. Um, so I, my advice to millennials out there is, you know, you're you guys are going to disrupt uh, a lot of jobs and, uh, you know, the jobs aren't there for you right now. So you got to go create your own uh, or you got to find a company that's going to be that disruption and you got to attach yourself to it and go help, you know, shift those jobs to better quality services, um, you know. Uber, for example, I, I used to have a, a, you know, a fleet of cars, not to brag, but I started to realize like how much money of Uber credits is that a DMV, uh, you know, having to have it washed every day, you know, like, uh, you know, I have a, whatever the car is, let's say it's a hundred thousand dollar car. How many Uber rides is that? Right? Like, why would I house that car if I can have a car within 10 minutes at my house at any time in a high quality service? So Uber's disrupting not only taxi cabs, black cars, but now car purchasing. And eventually these cars are going to be driven by computers, not by drivers. So, you know, you got to attach yourself to the right companies that are doing this disruption. So you, you know, you have a piece of the disruption, so to speak. And, and this is it. This is a cool time for us right now. This is like the industrialization of America all over again, but it's a deindustrialization of America that's occurring right now.
Yeah. Now, I mean, if you look at the industrial age was created, or the middle class was created in the industrial age, and like you said, it's it's unfolding. So it's it's uh, pretty gnarly to, to watch and be a part of, man. So yeah. I know you do so many of these interviews daily, and, and, and I know you've been asked by every question on the sun, but have you ever been asked, or, or, or is there ever a question that you never get asked that you wish you'd get asked when you're doing podcasts or interviews like this? Yeah. Well, for one, uh, I, I, I haven't been doing a lot of interviews lately because I was so focused on writing the book. So I'm just I'm happy to be back in the game. And this is one of the very first that I've done recently. Um, the question that uh, I, I, I tend not to get asked that, you know, I, I, I wish I got asked, especially from an audience that's primarily a millennials would be, you know, what would the older Ryan tell the younger Ryan? Right. And, you know, however you want to frame that. But in essence, you know, now that I've got some years, uh, you know, underneath my belt 20 years into my career, what would I tell the young Ryan? And the answer to that question is real simple. I tell the young Ryan, play the long game. Don't make short-term decisions, right? You're gonna be alive 20 years from now. You're gonna wanna have more wealth and, and, and or you know, you know, more time freedom or more fulfillment or whatever it is that you want. And so you know, I've made decisions uh, uh, out of fear, out of insecurity, out of not knowing what the future holds that you know, perhaps I would not have made going back now looking at my timeline so, you know, I, I look at my timeline and if you look at it from where I started to where I am now, it looks like this you know, rocket ship. But there were some years down there, man, that, you know, that I wanted to give up or go back to, you know, get a job or or throw in the towel or whatever it is. And so now having some, you know, some some time behind me and underneath my belt, I look at it and say, pay attention to your timeline. And that's a concept I write a lot about in my book as well. For the next one, uh, Rock Bottom Drop Show. Yeah, love it. Can't wait for it. All right, you guys. So um, as I said, we're doing a, uh, a promo here. So here, here's the steps of the promo, right? So first step of the promo is you got to share this interview. We want to make sure we get as many eyeballs and ears on this interview. You can share it anywhere, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whatever medium that you're watching this. Make sure that you go share this interview. Um, step number two, you need to join the GSD Mode private Facebook group, right? Because this is where you're going to post these in here, and this is where we're going to track this. So make sure that you share that. All links will be below to these um, here in the comments. So you got to join the group. Then from there, you got to go out there and buy Ryan's first book, you know, right? And I'm not doing this, you guys, to, to go out there it, just plug Ryan, um, but it's just been such a massive book for me, and I, I started this podcast to give back to you guys, so those of you that watch this, man, this is a book that all of you must read, entrepreneur or not, go out there and read it, so got to buy the book, you can download the audio, buy it, but shoot a picture that you've shared it, shoot a picture that you bought this, then uh, we're going to enter you in a drawing, like I said, we're going to give 100 of these away, 100 books and 100 GSD mode shirts of your choice, we got the different styles of shirts, um, and then we will uh, get those shipped out to you, so, um, and, and, and then one last thing to the listeners, I know we end every podcast with this, you guys, but information without implementation is just the start of delusion, right? Information is not power. It's taking that information, taking massive action on it uh, into a world that creates power. So Ryan shared so much amazing information with you guys. They sit, take something that you learned today, take immediate action. Don't wait. Implement right now so you can create the life that you want and deserve. And Ryan, dude, this has been such a massive honor, man. I can't stress right. this enough, brother. I'm ready to come back on anytime, brother. I appreciate it. I uh, I love connecting with you, and I appreciate your audience for supporting the book launch, man. It's awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, you guys, we will see you next time. All right, thanks, guys.